All right, so we're going to test the camera. Let's see if we're camera. Yeah, we're we're broadcasting. That's good. So, got two people here. If anybody is in the uh, virtual classroom and uh, YouTube. I'll have my phone in case you want to answer questions. So today we're doing one of the fun chapters in IMC. It's the creative strategy chapter. So if I asked you if marketing is an art or a science, what would you say? Science. You think marketing is a science? Okay. Um, I would say art. You'd say it's art. Why do you say it's art? Because I feel like when marketing, you have to be creative, and whenever you're in an art class, you need creativity as well. So okay. So just going hand in hand. So you have to be creative in marketing, and you have to find ways that are unique. We've talked about the communication process in here. And we talked about this idea of noise and clutter and having to break through that. And the way you do that is by providing something that's novel, that you know, sort of gets consumers thinking. So it's, it's creativity that's artistic. That's something that's, I guess, subjective compared to science, which we generally say is objective. And you said that marketing is a science because? Because you have to kind of um, go and do your research and you have to make sure that you're looking back at like past things and you're applying it to future things and you're kind of. Okay. So there is a scientific aspect to marketing. We can absolutely study consumers looking at, for example, in the early studies in marketing tended to be logistics studies. And that was sort of how we move goods from producer to consumer in an efficient way, given the fact that a lot of goods, particularly if you go back to the sort of dawn of the birth of marketing as a discipline, there was this interest in, you know, this stuff is highly perishable. A lot of the goods and things that we purchased were you know, literally farm products. It was about, you know, feeding a population and a lot of those can spoil. And so it was how to get these things. And so past is prologue. So we know that we're going to have this huge demand in the winter for these staples that we need to get to consumers. And we can study that and we can move that in a scientific perspective rather than just sort of guessing about how much product is going to be needed. We can figure it out, looking again, you know, past being prologue, and then try to figure out the, the best way to approach the problem of getting it to them. And that's, that's certainly scientific. We can also study the consumer from a scientific perspective, figure out what it is that they want and need, what's going to likely be a success. So as sort of an overview, again, going back to some of the things that we talked about in earlier classes or that you should have had in things like principles of marketing. So there are sort of three epics of marketing and each of those epics corresponds to a different marketing philosophy that we have. The oldest and the, the one that existed for most of human history was called the production era. And the idea of the production era was if you build it, they will come. If you, if you have something that's, that's at all a value, you can sell this product and, and make a profit at it because goods were scarce for most of human history. And so if you had something that was useful or that could you know, sustain life, food, milk from your cow, eggs from your chickens, wool from your sheep, things like that, you, you could sell them very easily. So if you built it, people would, would buy it. Um, there weren't a lot of choices. Most producers for most of human history lived fairly close to the consumers that they were satisfying. And so you have this production philosophy that starts to change in the beginning of the, the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, when we go through rapid industrialization and all of a sudden we're able to produce more than we can consume. We're able to have an abundance of 
mass produced goods, starting with the automobile and Henry Ford, right? So we go from this production philosophy to a sales philosophy, which is now consumers have a choice because we figured out how to manufacture this stuff quickly and cheaply. And we figured out, you know, how to get it to from farm to market or from producer to consumer more efficiently. So we're going to have the sales era. As a sales professor, I tell students that this is the, the era that brings up most of the bad feelings that we have about sales. It's, you know, you have a lot of students that when we talk about our sales program, they say, well, I want to go into business, but I don't want to be a salesman. And they don't realize that, you know, for 80 percent of business majors, their first job is going to be in sales. And whether they're an accounting major or a finance major, it's going to be selling, right? A, a financial product, a financial service, something like that. Most of these bad feelings that we get towards sales stem from this era where it was about the ADA model, awareness, interest, desire, action, making the pitch, getting people to buy your product, and then moving on, you know, and, and to the next consumer that you wanted to sell to. Then we start in the middle of the 20th century, largely in like in the 1950s, we begin to realize that we can study the consumer from a scientific perspective. We can make a consumer part of the team. So we started doing focus groups. If you've watched uh, a series that's rather old now, but was pretty popular when I first came back to UCO and started teaching marketing, it was called Mad Men. And it was all about Madison Avenue's ad advertising agencies and the firms that, that produced sort of the golden age of advertising. And in some of those, they show focus groups where they, they brought women in, for example, in one of the episodes to try on makeup. And then they you know had a two-way mirror and they watched them and figured out how they were using the makeup, what kinds of colors they liked, how they were choosing and deciding. And so that was the scientific perspective. Now we've entered into an era of value co-creation or relationship marketing. So it's both. The answer is, if you ask whether or not marketing is an art or a science, it's both. It's both an art and a science. So there is a creative aspect to it. It's interesting that you now have, for the first time in history, you actually have some philosophers who are using scientific research. So philosophy as a discipline historically has stood on the idea that you make arguments and those arguments stand uh, independent of sort of public opinion of things. But one of the things that is an age old adage that's been used in philosophy forever and ever and ever is this idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So when we talk about creative strategy in marketing, the idea would be that this is very artistic and that what people will respond to from a creative standpoint is largely independent of what we could study in terms of uh, a scientific perspective because it's all very subjective. What kind of ads you will respond to are completely different than perhaps anybody else in, in the room. Well, it turns out that that's not quite true. Beauty actually isn't in the eye of the beholder. And this is where uh, an area of philosophy has started looking at sort of scientific studies. So the idea for, for a long period of time in the history of the institution or the academy, philosophy and science were not sort of separate deals. And there was this, you know, this sort of philosophy of science idea. And then we've seen kind of a divergence uh, come into play where philosophy is like, well, we're gonna search for ultimate truths. This is called metaphysics. And we're going to make these arguments, and these arguments, for example, when we talked about ethics for Kant, are categorical, right? They, they are independent of reference of experience. How do you know something is ethical or not ethical for Kant is independent of whether or not we look at what's happening in the real world. We can discern these duties a priori, and there's, there's problems with that ethical theory, although I tend to, to ascribe to it. Now, all of a sudden, in the subfield of philosophy called aesthetics, you see philosophers, you know, what is beautiful actually engaging in scientific research. Well, one of the things that they did and one of the studies that I looked at was, is beauty really in the eye of the beholder? How do we judge whether or not something is beautiful? It turns out that children are enormously honest, particularly 
really small children are enormously honest. If you've ever listened to, if you've ever been around a small, it's one of the reasons I don't have children, right? I, they make me nervous. I don't like them. They say things. You know, I, I remember when my brother was a little kid and sort of my parents had, had told him, you know, where babies come from. You know, he runs up to some woman in the supermarket and says, I know what's inside of you and I know how it got there. I mean, that's, that's what children, they're just like brutally honest about things. Little kids will just say, you're fat. They'll just, you know, they'll just, you know, like, you're fat. And they're, they're horrible little creatures. They haven't learned middle class morality yet. So what they're doing is they take these very small children, babies, and they show them pictures on a screen. And then they watch their reactions. And it turns out that children, these little babies that they, that they, that they put in front of these pictures will stare at a picture of a symmetrical face far longer than they will a picture of an asymmetrical face. And the classic example of this that they, in this program that I was watching on this is they showed the kids a picture of Denzel Washington. He has almost a perfectly symmetrical face. Not, not quite. If it's too symmetrical, it's kind of creepy. They, they do this. You can, you can get absolutely symmetrical, but it's pretty symmetrical. And then they show the kid a picture of Lyle Lovett. You all don't know who Lyle Lovett is. He was a country and Western star, sort of, I guess. The, the biggest thing that he became known for is somehow uh, on some, you know, alternate universe that, that zapped us through, you know, the wormhole. He actually managed to a very, for a very brief period of time, get married to Julia Roberts. And everybody was sitting there going, huh, what? You know, like at the time she was considered, she was one of the biggest stars in Hollywood and she was considered one of the most, you know, beautiful women on earth. I'll show you a picture of Lyle Lovett. Cause you all don't know who he is. See if I can find a really good picture of him. several here and switch the camera views. So here's a picture. You can see, oh, wrong screen. <laughs> Didn't flip the screens. There we go. In this picture, you can see he's got kind of a crooked smile. The chin is completely asymmetrical. One ear is considerably, now that's, everybody has one ear that's generally a little bit lower on their head. And you have one ear canal that's slightly larger than the other. And there's reasons for that, right? I mean, in terms of the way we hear, but it's it's really noticeable on his face as composed to as opposed to someone like Denzel Washington. Here's another picture. You can see, I mean, he's got a crooked, you know, jaw, um, crooked smile, uh, as opposed to someone like Denzel Washington. Let's see. The jaw is square. The face is fairly symmetrical. These kids will look at this picture for a lot longer than they'll look at a picture of Lyle Lovett. And they found some, let's see, that's the, I don't want to do that. Let's switch back to there. So we're starting to, to recognize that maybe what we think of as beauty being in the eye of the beholder is really not. Another study that, that I've recently come across in terms of aesthetics, if you ask artists from all different countries and societies to paint an ideal scene, uh, you know, a, a landscape, they're almost all the same. The proportionality is almost all the same in all of these, you know, it doesn't matter what society it is. And they'll all have, for example, some kind of water. They'll all show some kind of water feature. And, and there are elements of all of these that are similar. So we think of creativity as being subjective, but 
as we're finding out, maybe more and more, it's not. Music, we think of music as being one of these things that is completely, you know, what's your, what's your taste in music? Turns out that they can use mathematics to figure out what are the most popular sorts of musical arrangements. And we can come up with songs that are popular, you know, using, using artificial intelligence and, and, you know, algorithms to figure out what is, what is popular. So it's a combination of art and science, even in the creative strategy part of marketing. So creativity in advertising, this is what we think of as being the art kind of part of marketing. But I, I would caution you again, what we see is we see processes develop that are going to ensure that it used to be that they would just put kind of creatives, you know, like off to the side and let them come up with, you know, storyboards and things like that and pitch it. And whether or not it was successful just was sort of hit or miss. And some of the most creative ads have failed to produce results. People, ads that people responded, and I think I showed you in here an ad called The Herding Cats, which was EDS. Nobody remembered what, what company that was after they showed the ad, but it was a, an enormously creative ad, right? It, it really did, it, it struck a chord with consumers. It was funny, it was sort of irreverent. It played on these economic, uh, uh, economic images of the American culture which existed for a very brief period of time. So some marketers would argue that one of the problems that we have in this area is that creatives are more concerned with developing award-winning ads that are highly like the, the, the herding cats ad that are, that are very popular, but not necessarily effective. And how do we, how do we combine what is creative with what is effective and how can we tell? Well, it is becoming easier and easier as we can watch when we, before we release ads, for example, we can sit there and use eye tracking technology to tell what people are looking at, what they're attracted to, and whether or not they respond favorable to the ad and whether or not that's likely to turn into a, a, a purchase. Now, what I would caution you in this, and in, in a book called Biology, which I mentioned in here before by Martin Lindstrom, which is B-U-Y, O-L-O-G-Y, instead of biology as in B-I-O-L-O-G-Y. He's, this is the science of why we buy what we buy. What Lindstrom argues is that we can absolute, with almost absolute certainty predict whether or not something is going to be popular. What I would say is we can look at what parts of the brain are triggering and we can figure out whether or not people are responding positively to it. But that doesn't necessarily tell us what they are thinking about, right? We can tell that they're getting some pleasure or whether or not that pleasure is going to, again, with regard to the ad, I'd be willing to bet if we did these experiments and showed people the herding cats video, every time I show that video, my students laugh. I mean, it's, it's funny, they enjoy it, they're engaged. Does it turn into sales? Maybe not. So, uh, but we are getting better and better at predicting these things. And it's increasingly important. Production costs are increasing, particularly in an era in which labor costs, and a lot of this is, is labor intensive until recently, labor costs are, are going up and coming up with this stuff. Now, is it always gonna be that way? How many of you have used chat GPT? One person. Nobody else in here has used ChatGPT. What did you use ChatGPT for? To write a cover letter. To write a cover letter. I actually have, have colleagues now that are arguing, not at this school, we're very worried about students using ChatGPT to come up with answers to essay exams, for example. I actually have one colleague that I know of that's like, if my students aren't using ChatGPT, so first of all, write your whatever it is that you want to write and then have ChatGPT and compare them and see what, what you're missing, which is better, what elements are, are better in ChatGPT. So we're, we're starting to develop content, again, using artificial intelligence that is highly creative. I mean, you can go to ChatGPT and say, you know, like, write me a story about this, and it, it will come up with this stuff. 
I follow a couple of British guys. One's name's Josh and one's Ollie. I think I've talked about them before in here. They have a YouTube site called Jolly and they actually did this. So uh, Ollie decided he was going to deep fake Josh so that they could, you know, in theory, not have to sit around and produce content anymore. They could get avatars to basically do that. And so he came up with this whole thing and I'll show you one of the examples that he came up with. Let me see if I can find it. So just as a, uh, See if we can get him to do another one. So that's that's uh, tell me a joke. Josh Carrot, his last name's Carrot, and his partner actually had them write an entire book using AI called um, My Adventures in Carrot Land or something like that, which they sell on their channel, and. Then he came up with a whole episode where he used artificial intelligence to deep fake Josh into the video that he made as, as a gift for Josh one year. And Josh was sort of horrified by this whole thing. So we're, we're getting to the point where artificial intelligence now can start producing a lot of this stuff. And maybe that should worry us or maybe not. Maybe it's just we're becoming more efficient. At, at doing these things. And maybe that will bring these costs of production where uh, the textbook says that, you know, like production costs can exceed a million dollars. That's that's way low. That's a way low figure at this point because of the amount of money they're having to spend on hiring creatives, but maybe come cheaper with AI. So what does a creative ad get us? Well, it's more memorable and that's good. Like if we remember the ad, everybody remembered the Herding Cats commercial, they just didn't remember what company it was for, but they remember the ad. I mean, it was, it was an enormously popular ad. The Budweiser ads that we have had for a long time with the Clydesdales, what is it about those ads that people remember? Does it translate into sales for Budweiser? I don't know, but people remember the ads. They're enormously moving. Let's look at, uh, let me look at one of those if I can find it. So that ad is enormously, like that was an enormously popular ad. So it's creative. Everybody who saw that ad remembered that ad. The song is beautiful. It's a touching story, right? It just makes you want to puppy. It makes you want to puppy. It makes you want to Clydesdale. Yeah. So they're longer lasting. 
uh, it works according to research with less media spending. You don't have to play that ad a whole lot. People remember it. People Google that ad. They watched it over and over again. And it can build a fan community. It can build, you know, a, a connection with your, with your base, right? If they're poorly conceived, ads can be a liability if they don't sort of do these things. But creative creativity doesn't always increase sales or even revival of a declining brand. This is one of the things that, that companies like Budweiser face. Now, I'm going to tell you, so I am a huge Bud Light fan. When you, when you go to law school, if you weren't a drinker before, you're probably a drinker after you go to law school. Uh, I think Bud Light is like the best beer on the planet. Your generation has a tendency to think that like microbreweries uh, are, are the bomb. I have a tendency to think microbrewery, like there's a reason they're small. They're, they're not very good for the most part. But, you know, Budweiser is facing, that's one of the reasons that they come out with different versions of beer all the time. Some of which make it, some of which don't. At one point in time, red lagers were all the rage. And so Budweiser and Coors and everybody came up with, I think Budweiser's was Red Wolf, I think is what they came up with. You can't find Red Wolf anymore. And I think one of the other big breweries came up with Red Dog. So uh, even a creative ad may not, may not help a declining brand. There's just more competition and people are willing to try more and more stuff that is not necessarily huge, big, you know, corporate branding. So what is creativity? There's a spectrum. There are different perspectives on the spectrum. Of course, again, one of the things that I would say is that what we are seeing broadly is that there is a more scientific approach to this. One end of the spectrum says that creativity should equal sales that you should see a return on your investment. Another end of the spectrum says that creativity has aesthetic or artistic value in and of itself. And you should appreciate the thing in and of itself. Well, generally speaking, when we hire advertising firms or integrated marketing communication firms, you know, we don't value the thing in and of itself. And this is one of the questions that we have in marketing, for example. Is there anything, services marketing, the services marketing literature suggests that almost everything is a service. Even goods, according to some services scholars like Mary Jo Bittner, are actually services because you don't value the thing in and of itself. This seems to be a completely product type of marketing, right? This device that I'm holding up, but I don't value this device for the thing in and of itself, do I? Although Steve Jobs thought that everything that he created was a thing of beauty. When they came up with the first, you know, Mac, Macintosh computers, they were in a, this box and one of the first designs they came up with. On the inside of the box, if you look at a, at a work of art, what's usually at the bottom of a work of art the art's signature is usually at the bottom. They, they take pride in this and they sign the piece. Steve Jobs, the first Macintosh that they built, he had all of the, the primary developers sign the inside of the box. And they somebody said, like, Steve, why are you doing this? Nobody is going to look at this. And he said, somebody will. Somebody will look at this. And so you valued the thing in and of, you know, for itself. But mo most of us don't, right? You don't value the MacBook. You don't value the iPhone for the thing in and of itself. You value it for the service that it provides you, which is what? It's not really a phone anymore. This is a mis, you know, misnamed item because how many of you actually talk on the phone? Like my generation loved to talk on the phone. That was a big deal to us was to talk on the phone. You're generating, this is not actually a phone. This is like an entertainment device. 
you're you're playing whatever is the most popular, you know, free game on on your phone anymore. Solitaire cash, where you think you're going to win a million dollars playing solitaire cash. I mean, like, okay, probably not. But it's a it's a service, right? So if you're the client, what you're probably going to say is, and you know, it depends on one's role, is what the text tells you. If you're the client, you're going to say, look, this ad, yeah, may be creative, but I need it to translate into something that's going to bring me results for my business. If, on the other hand, you're the creative person who develops it, and you feel yourself as an artist, you probably value it more for the artistic value than it than than the um, than the the results that it creates, right? So what is the determinant of creativity? What is, how is it that we get creativity and how do we tell when it's creative? Well, it's the ability to generate fresh, unique and appropriate ideas. So it's the ability to come up with something that is novel. How do you do that? How do you come up with something that's novel, different or unusual? If we think about the herding cats ad, that's divergent. It's divergent from the picture that we have in our minds of what a cowboy should be. Here's these rugged, sort of dirty, you know, guys out there on the, the plane hurting these, you know, little cats. They're, you know, they're kind of cuddling the cats. And this is not what you normally think of, right? It has originality. It's rare or surprising. It's not what you expect. There's elements of flexibility in creativity. Going from one perspective to the other. Elaboration. Focusing on unexpected details. Now, what is the unexpected detail in the ad, in the Clydesdale and Puppy ad? The what? The dog keep coming back. Yeah, the unexpected. It's like there's this there's this bond that's formed between two different species. We generally don't think of that. We generally we don't think of like dogs and horses as being friends. Usually, they're antagonistic. If you've ever been, you know, like most dogs on a farm tend to be like herding dogs and they want to like you know nip at the horse's heels and, and corral them and do things like that well, so also the horses banding together to stop the car right uh -huh. yeah that's i mean that's a uh you know like they've, they've obviously formed this bond with this dog and even though the other horses may not have formed the same bond they're willing to work together to rescue the dog from the evil buyer of the dog synthesis a nexus between these ideas so there's this connection right and this is the way you should argue you know like in, in an essay which i i will get to grading the essays just as quickly as i can um so you know you have a premise one premise two premise three and you have some connection between these which we call the nexus they're not disparate, completely disparate ideas. Between them, you know, in this paper, I'm going to argue that the ethical position is one that employs utilitarian analysis to come up with uh, an argument uh, as to whether or not uh, marketing to children is you know, unethical. Children are not, you know, fully formed. Their brains are not capable of understanding fully the implications of things that happen. Therefore, you know, maybe we shouldn't engage in marketing children. Lots of countries, for example, use this kind of argument. 
that you can't market to children the way we do in the United States because we have this thing called the First Amendment. So, for example, you know, why is it that we can't market to children? Well, because until you're about 25, your brain is still developing. And so you lack impulse control, right? Because of the lack of impulse control, children may engage in behavior that is unhealthy. So, for example, when I was in Germany, they couldn't advertise and couldn't have, I think, I think it was illegal for them to have toys in the Happy Meal. There's almost nothing of nutritional value in a Happy Meal. And there's calories there. They don't want incentives. Right. They don't want, they, they, you know. The idea is that the will is overborne if you do these things. Now, in America, our response is that's up to the parents to decide, right? I know in England, we have carrot sticks over toys instead of they, they do, and they have uh, fruit and things like yeah. that in Germany as a choice. Although, you know, do kids want fruit as opposed to French fries? No, right? I mean, because McDonald's fries are like the most delicious. If they're fresh... They're like the most delicious, you know, little carb addict bites on the, on the planet. planet. Then you have artistic value. And relevance is the second component. So determinants of creativity, we have divergence, we have these elements of divergence, then we have relevance. The degree to which the ad is meaningful and useful to the consumer. So the creative challenge to write copy that's based on research. Okay, so again, going back to the question of whether or not marketing is an art or a science, it's both, and you're going to have this combination. So you have to have some research into this. Who is the customer? How do we determine who the customer is? Well, we have scientific ways of going about figuring that out. Who is the target market for this? If we went back again to the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, well, it was mass producing goods with the assumption that people were basically homogenous. They basically all just sort of needed the same things. We're, you know, we, we all have to wear pants, so we're gonna make pants and we're just coming kind of three different sizes, small, medium, and large. Not exactly, right? That's We recognize that that's no longer the case. And in fact, you can get mass customization of lots of stuff. You can order all the stuff. One of the things that I thought I would never, ever do was order clothes online. I order a lot of clothes online. I have, you know, I have this one shirt maker that I know that, that, that I, you know, they make shirts perfectly. They're in, they're in the United Kingdom. And that's who I order dress shirts from. I've gotten rid of a lot of my dress shirts. At one time I had something like 250 French cuff dress shirts. So if I'm gonna wear dress shirts, I like to wear French cuffs. There's this one dress, dress shirt maker in, in the United Kingdom, makes them perfectly you know, for, for my body based on sort of the sizes. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of divergence in terms of what the sizes are. Even if they say it's like a you know, 16 and a half, 34, um, how that's cut. Where, you know whether it's a slim fit or a full fit kind of kind of dress shirt. Then developing creative briefs, looking at your strategy statements, and coming up with objectives for the app. Many creatives argue that it's inherently risky this process, and it is, although it's becoming less so. That clients need to take risks, but they don't in many instances. I can give you an example of this in our local market. How many of you guys remember the two guys ads for Sonic? Do you, everybody remembers the two guys ads for Sonic. I hated those ads. I thought they were absolutely, those two guys are completely obnoxious and annoying. And by the way, they don't fit 
the demographic of Sonic's customers. Sonic's customers are not, so they're, they're not me. They're not middle-aged professional men that go to Sonic. Who goes to Sonic? What? College kids. You think it's college kids? Some. No. The biggest demographic of Sonic is soccer moms yeah. and high schoolers. Right? That's it. Soccer moms. Are those two guys at all representative? They're middle-aged, creepy guys. But Cliff Hudson just was insistent that, like, he was like, Oh, like they saw a dip. They, they got rid of the two guys. Somebody convinced them they got to get rid of the two guys. They saw a small, a small dip in their revenue. And Cliff was like, you got to bring the two guys back. N no. But it was, uh, you know, he was convinced the two guys were what was, what was selling that. No. Like, I mean, like almost no, I, can't, I, I just can't imagine. They were the most obnoxious, annoying ads i mean I, like it, it's one of those things do you ever watch things that you just absolutely hate that grate on your nerves just i mean like i don't know why but I, you know it's just like it's like a train wreck you can't help but watch it that's what those ads were like um should we have creativity versus the hard sell this is the suits versus the poets should we should we rely more on on you know cliff hudson Again, not representative. I mean, one of the things that was interesting about Cliff being CEO of Sonic, <laughs> not representative. You know, I mean, he would come up with these ideas. One of my one of my colleagues worked for them. That it was like, you know, you're projecting, Cliff. You're projecting. He would keep coming up with these ideas that he wanted her to to put, you know, implement as a product development. So Sonic is one of these places where they pretty much have to come up with new things based on what they already have because they just don't have a lot of space in a Sonic, right? It's a it's a very small contained space compared to other kitchens. And so like they, they can't change. So it's usually combinations of things that, that they already have that they can easily get. And he, he would, you know, insist on, on trying things that they didn't product test that, you know, nobody, because he's like, well, that's what I like, margarita cherry slush. No, again, you know, not the demographic that that uh, that goes to Sonic. Maybe you should listen more to the to the poets in that instance. Creative personnel. What are the perceptions of creatives? Well, the perception among a lot of business people, particularly, and this is where you get this tension between creatives and and the suits, the suits versus the poets, is that there's a perception that creatives are free willing, they're free thinking, they're eccentric. And that may be true, historically. Yeah. I think right? you need that, though, to kind of think outside of the box. I think you do. Integrated marketing communication, the text tells you, requires creativity from everybody, right, and this ability. But again, a lot of companies, particularly if they're an older brand, if we're going through where we are in the product life cycle, so a lot of this depends on where you are in the product life cycle is going to depend on, you know, how much risk you can take. Where do you think, for example, so products like people have life cycles and those life cycles can be different, right? You can have, so you start on a timeline here from launch and to decline. They can look like that. Some products enter the market and they quickly become popular and then they, they leave or exit the market very quickly. When I was in college, one of the things that became popular overnight were selling for huge amounts of money and people were buying them as investments, which I thought was a stupid idea. I thought it was really a stupid investment. Were these things called Beanie Babies? You all probably don't remember Beanie. I like people were like buying these things up and trading them and selling them and like making, you know, huge amounts of money off of these. They were kind of ugly little stuffed dolls they were not cute <laughs> i bought one beanie baby that i thought was gonna like make a you know a lot the of money diana. the princess diana beanie baby yeah i thought that was gonna be the one that and i think it actually still is worth 
quite a bit of money, anything uh, with Princess Diana. And I don't know what happened to that stupid Beanie Baby. I guess I need to go through my closets and see if I can find it, try to sell the Beanie Baby. So, you know, depends on the product life cycle. If you're, if you have a lot of money, if you're, you know, if you're a startup in Silicon Valley, for example, and you're flush with cash, because literally what's happening with uh, Silicon Valley Bank and others, like these people need to remember history, but they don't. You could, you could see this coming a mile away. They used to, we had this problem in Oklahoma. There's a book, you can read it. It's, you probably should read it. It's a rather old book now called Funny Money. And you all have seen this historic site in Oklahoma. How many of you have been to Penn Square Mall? Almost everybody's been to Penn Square Mall. In the northwest corner of the Penn Square Mall parking lot is a bank building. That bank used to be, it started out as Penn Square Bank. And Penn Square Bank, directly to the south and east of there, there is a large tower that was very modern for the time and sort of the height of fashion. That was the tower that they built to become their headquarters. Penn Square Bank built this tower. It's across um, I-44. It's the dark tower. Now I think it's called the Valiant Bank Tower. So you've probably seen this. Well, Penn Square Bank in the 1970s and 80s was loaning money as fast as they could to anybody who said they were in the oil business. That's Oklahoma. And I have a whole Oklahoma to English dictionary, by the way. Oil, O-W-L, business, B-I-D-D-N-E-S-S. That's Oklahoman for oil business. I had a judge tell me one time, this is part of my Oklahoma to English dictionary. Well, it seems to me that the epitome of your case is what? Uh, the epitome. E P I T O M E. He spelled it for me. The epitome of your. And I'm like, okay. That word is pronounced epitome. <laughs> Not the epitome. In Oklahoma, we have fiancies. That's Oklahoman for fiance. My fiance and I are going to go get hitched. In the 1970s and early 80s, Penn Square Bank, if you said you were in the all business, they'd loan you a million dollars, you know, and make the deal on the back of a napkin at Junior Supper Club down the street on Northwest Expressway. They were loaning money hand over fist. So, you know, like transport this into modern day, we've got Silicon Valley Bank. If you say you're in, you know, if you're in, if you're in tech, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this. They, they keep saying they're a tech company. I have no idea how they think they're a tech company called WeWork, right? How is that a tech company? They're, they're loaning millions of dollars. So if you have lots of money and you're launching a, a new you know, tech business and you're flush with money, you can afford to be really creative, right? Because you've got all this, you got all this you know, cash that they're willing to loan you and you're launching a product and you got to get it out there. Whereas opposed to, you know, like Budweiser or Coca-Cola, which are long established brands you know, are maybe not going to take as much of a risk and don't need to necessarily take as much of a risk. It's about reminding people of the good times. What does the puppy and Clydesdale ad remind you? Why do they use the Clydesdales? Well, historically, you know, that's what, I mean, for a very short period of time, Budweiser used to develop and they've kept them, these draft horses to develop their product or to, to deliver their product. And there's sort of this iconic image associated with Budweiser, right? So, um, you know, how much creativity do you need depends a lot on the product life cycle. So what is the creative process? So James Webb Young says that creativity is similar to an assembly line. You can think of this in terms of assembly line. There's five steps. 
there's immersion. You gather information. You immerse yourself in the product. Uh, what is it that we are? What is it that we have? What is it we're trying to sell here? Learn about the product, and then you have to think about this product. You have to digest the information that you have generated. He then says you need to have sort of an incubation period. You need to go away from it and think about it, not think about it for a while, put it out of your subconscious or out of your conscious mind and into the subconscious and let you let you think about things. Most of you don't do this when you write papers or you write essays for the exam in here, which again, I, I will get to that as quickly as I can. I'm, I'm working to get through everybody. I had all of my you know, classes turn in essay exams at the, about the same time. So I'm working to get through them. If you, if you really think about this, how many of you, if, you, if you've written a paper for a class, you get to the point where you just can't think about it anymore and you need to go like take a nap, uh, go to bed, then come back to it and think about it the next day and like ideas will hit you. Hopefully that leads to some illumination, this birth of an idea. And then you have to check that with reality and verification. Does this idea seem to solve the problem? What is the story that you want to tell? And is that going to solve the problem that you have? Graham Wallace comes up with you know, something similar but slightly different idea in the art of thought. So you prep, you gather information, then you have incubation where you get away and let the ideas develop, then the illumination, you see the light. This is like the allegory of the cave, just one of the best worked out allegories in all of literature. And then refining and polishing the ideas through verification. So those are the steps in the creative process. So conducting research, how do we do that? Read everything that you can that's related to the product and the market. We're about to have the Challenger Sales Institute's spring competition. When we partnered with Loves to be the, the naming sponsor, I had to learn everything I could about Love's model. So a lot of people don't think of, this is one of the things in, in our sales world that we tell students is, you know, it doesn't sound like that would be the, you know, like when you say you're going to get a sales job and you're going to, you know, go to work for Love's, they think, I don't want to go to work for Love's. I didn't get a degree so that I could go, you know, ring up pop at, at a Love's country store. That's not what they're selling, right? Love's has a whole business to business model. So I had to immerse myself in their models and what they what it is that they're selling. So they sell light services, light, light mechanical services to tractor trailer operators. They sell tires to tractor trailer operators. They sell fuel, obviously, to, you know, uh, it's not just about providing you fuel with your car, but fuel for um, over the road trucking companies. And they sell something called factoring, which is, it's a loan product, right? So I had to talk to all of the people that, that do this with their salespeople, learn about it. I had a cousin who owns a small trucking company. So I talked to him to get his perspective on loves and things like that. And then figured out what it was he liked about that, what other clients liked about loves. I visited some Love's stores, you know. I use the Love's product myself. I have a large pickup truck. It's a Dually Dodge Ram 3500 out in the parking lot. Um, I did not actually go and work in and learn the client's business, but that's one way that you can do it is to, you know, embed yourself in the client's business to really, really understand it. Using qualitative research, focus groups, 
the agency brings customers in and asks them about the product. They have them try the products. Ethnographic research. This is from anthropology. And it's looking at consumers in their natural environment, figuring out how they use it. So I was on a flight back from New Mexico one year to visit my family. I was getting my PhD at New Mexico State. And this guy sitting next to me has this iPad. And I'm like, oh, you've got to, this was when iPads were fairly still novel. They were, you know, like, and I'm like, you've got an iPad. How do you like it? He's like, oh, it's great. They were, they were meant for business. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, they weren't. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's what Steve Jobs developed them for was for business. I'm like, no, that is not what the iPad was developed for. It's a horrible tool. For business, is that a is that an iPad or is that a? This is a surface. It's a surface. Okay. All right. Mine's an iPad. Yours is an iPad. Like, not really developed for business. At the time they were developed, they didn't have this wonderful little pen thing. Does that pen, like, when you write, does it does it come up with? Does it understand what you're yeah. writing, or does it come up? Does it? It doesn't. Uh, Oh, well, my handwriting's not that good. <laughs> well, I'm surprised you actually know cursive because <laughs> most students don't learn cursive anymore. They learn enough cursive to write their names, yeah. which my niece and nephew are both really lucky because their names are just series of loops. My niece's name is L, so like she learned cursive really fast because it's just it's just a series of loops. <laughs> you know, my nephew's name is Carson. It's again, it's just a series of loops. You can do that without picking up the pen, but they don't really teach cursive. Like they taught when I was in school, you learned cursive. They started you in like, I think second grade and you learned it through, you had like, you still had writing all the way through third or fourth grade. They would do penmanship. It was part of your report card. So, um, you know, like this guy says, oh, it's made for business. No, no, it's really not. Like, again, the iPhone, you know, like people is are like my sister, who's uh, who's an executive vice president for Boeing. The minute the iPhone came out, like, like they started yammering, they wanted the iPhone. The BlackBerry was much more user friendly for business than the iPhone. Why? Because it had a real keyboard. You can actually like if you know how to touch type, you can do the same thing really, really quickly with the BlackBerry that you can't do on this phone, right? So, but that's, but that's business people were demanding it and they were using these things for business, even though they're not terribly great for business. Why is that iPad not terribly great for business? It doesn't have a, a keyboard. It was meant for like surfing the web and, and having fun, right? With it. But that's what, that's not what it, people are using them for all kinds of stuff now. Business people, you know, our sales students all have iPads that they use to make presentations at competitions. And it, it is actually good for, for presentation because you've got a big screen and it's easy to swipe on. So, you know, it's become better. So this is ethnography, looking at the way people actually use products. How are they actually using this product? One of the, you know, one of the things that I do is, and particularly during COVID, I use my phone when we were, you know, doing the split thing where people would do 50% of the time, like you'd have one set of people coming in on Mondays and the other would come in on Wednesdays. You know, I used my cell phone so that students could text me. They could watch the live stream and they could text me answers and things like that. So actually seeing how they use the product and then verifying and revising uh, your your work to, to come up with the product, the advertising or integrated marketing communication. So the advertising campaign, most ads are series. So if you think about the puppy video, let's look at, you know, just cause I love the puppy videos. Uh, so that was the first one. Let's see if I can find the second. There were actually three. This is the last one. I'm having a hard time finding. 
the second one. But this is the last one. I think this is the third one. Love the Budweiser puppy ads. I wish they'd do more of those. So, you know, it's usually a series of messages. Oh my gosh, you know, he does. Very interesting song choice to go along with that. Uh huh. Yeah, I wouldn't have chosen. It, it pulls at your heartstrings. It, it sure does. That version. Uh -huh. Let me see if I can find the, the middle one. It was the, um, I think it was the training Budweiser. Let me see if I can find it. I don't think this one features the puppy. But this was one of the series. This was, these were all Super Bowl ads. They did them. This may be the first one. Gotta love the Budweiser Five Star Ads. How are you just gonna sell your horse to a beer movie? So most of these ads are series, right? Um, of messages that comprise the image. It's not just one, it's usually a whole campaign. What's the central theme? Well, the Budweiser ads, I think that was actually the first one. They started with that one, and then the puppy was the second year, and then the lost dog was the third year. I think that's right. Um so you're creative, you come up with a central message, uh, the storyline, and your creative brief spells out the basic elements that may be called a work plan or a creative blueprint. You search for major selling ideas, the big idea that makes customers stop and listen. 
to the ad. Now, again, one of the things about the Budweiser Clydesdale ads, I think they're great ads in terms of the creativity. They do make customers stop and listen. The music is fantastic. It's, you know, it's very emotional. Um, does it sell beer? Is there a connection? Is there a nexus between, I mean, I love these ads. You know, I love sharing the ads because everybody like gets teary eyed in, in the classroom. You know, um, is there is there a connection between that and and the the product that they're trying to sell? But does Budweiser need to necessarily? I mean, everybody knows what Budweiser is. Why do they continue to advertise? A lot of it is just to keep Budweiser relevant in the mind of the consumer, right? So that you you think about it and you have these feelings about you know being at the lake and drinking. Bud with your friends and things like that, you know, and, and these ads sort of help, you know, like you just feel wonderful about the product and the company as a whole um, when you watch these ads. Developing the major selling idea, finding ways to dramatically convey the key benefits, the unique selling position. That's one of the things that I don't think these ads do is that like, what is the benefits? Well, you know, a lot of it, if you would show people out at the lake, having fun and doing volleyball with Budweiser, that might be a better way of making this nexus and connection between uh, the product and, and the, the consumer. Any questions on that? All right, well, I'm gonna let you go 10 minutes early. If you feel cheated, you let me know and we'll stay 10 minutes late next Tuesday. <laughs> no one's gonna take me up on that offer. We got ducks, come and see, let me get this closed down and I will, uh, Thank you.